I, I usually like to start out this class with this quote from C.S. Lewis. Um, uh, C.S. Lewis, as you know, was a great Christian apologist and uh, writer, um, but he's also a world-class literary scholar. Uh, he was very well respected for his work on Milton and um, Shakespeare, medieval, um, late medieval writing. Um, and so he wrote uh, some books on that, uh, including a book called Experiment in Criticism. And this quote is from that book. And he says this about encountering art. The first demand any art makes upon us is surrender. And that's an intimidating word if you take it seriously, right? He wants us to surrender to an artwork, to in one way or another submit ourselves to what it is, the way that it wants us to see the world. I mean, isn't art a matter of thinking through the world, thinking about the world, thinking about what it means to be human, who we are in this world, what this world is? thinking about it in spatial terms, thinking about it by configuring objects and forms in relation to each other. So he advises us to start by looking, look, listen, receive, get yourself out of the way. There's no good asking yourself first whether the work b before you deserves such a surrender, for until you have surrendered, you can't possibly find out. You can't possibly find out the, the merits of the work until you've entered the work, until you've uh, kind of st stepped yourself into its structure. You can't understand the, the construction of this room and the merits of its construction until you submit yourself to it. You stand under its roof, you stand on, uh, on its floor. That is a risk because it might be an unstable structure. It might fall out from under you. It might collapse on you. Um, and I think that uh, we'll experience that happening in some of the work that we uh, uh, encounter in this course. Um, but you can't know until you s submit yourself to it, or surrender yourself to it. Um, and I, I begin this course with this quote because I think it's especially important for this course. I think this course, more than others in the department, tends to be met with a good deal more suspicion. Contemporary art is difficult. It just is really difficult. It's hard to digest. It's hard to see what's going on in it. In many ways, contemporary art took a really philosophical turn, and so it's not picturing thing. It's not, it's not speaking in the ways that you expect it to. It's speaking usually by screwing up the way that it's supposed to speak. Um, and that has a sort of philosophical point, but it doesn't come at you directly. It, it presents something and kind of hits you from the side. <laughs> uh, so it's difficult, um, but uh, I think um, if, we, if we kind of enter it together with this sort of giving it enough line, giving it enough benefit of the doubt to enter it, try to understand it from the inside, and, and then if critiques are necessary, and they probably will be necessary, um, uh, level those critiques from the inside rather than from the outside throwing grenades over the wall, which is, in all honesty, how um, Christians in the arts have operated for 100 years. <laughs> I don't think so much anymore. 20th century, that was how we pretty much operated, throwing grenades over the wall without understanding what was going on. So um, from C.S. Lewis, we'll, who was not shy to cri uh, criticize, um, certainly, we'll, we'll take this kind of injunction to enter, to submit ourselves to it, and try to uh, um, find out what work is worth um, continuing with and what is not. Um, for the rest of the syllabus, I'm pretty much going to let you read it on your own. I'll let you read the course objectives, the course overview. Basically what this course will look like is um, some days we'll spend here, and the purpose of our days spent here is to build a framework. Um, 
a framework for understanding what's going on. Give ourselves some vocabulary, give ourselves some concepts that we can use to understand what's going on in those contemporary galleries and art museums. Uh, and then we'll spend uh, others of our class times going to those contemporary galleries and museums. That's a really important part of this class. Um, and it's kind of a, a balancing act. If we, are, if we only spend our times in the museum, our time in the museums, we tend to be somewhat confused about what's going on there, <laughs> somewhat baffled. But I think we're in LA, it, it would be a, a great, um, a great, um, tragedy if we only spend our time looking at a projection and a screen. So we'll, we'll be sure to go out, spend some time in those museums, encountering the work uh, directly. And then in addition to that, you have uh, readings. Uh, and these readings, you'll have them every week. Um, they are in a course pack that you can purchase from the bookstore. It looks something like uh, this. How much is this running, out of curiosity? It's what? 50? 44? Man. I'll keep working on that. Every year I try to uh, reduce the cost, and it doesn't seem to have worked this time around. Um, anyway. Uh, uh, that uh, course pack is put together um, in such a way that it's um, a sampling, meant to be a sampling of some of the most prominent writers, uh, essays, articles about uh, art over the last 60 years or so. So uh, pick that up, read it diligently, we'll uh, do a good job, as you'll see today, of incorporating those readings into class. Um, if you look at the second page of your syllabus, you do have some required materials. Uh, the first and foremost is your course pack. Uh, in addition to that, uh, you need to take notes in this class. Um, you're not going to turn them in, but you really need to have some space where you're responding to and tracking uh, what we're doing in class because it's a dense course. <laughs> some of this stuff that we're doing in here is pretty dense. So um, you'll want to write it down and so you're able to process through it on your own. Just a couple of notes about the course requirements, just so um, we're on the same page. Uh, first, attendance. I'm a huge stickler for attendance. Um, I just have no res respect for absenteeism, to be honest. Uh, uh, so uh, I expect you to be here. I also know that life is sometimes challenging or difficult. Some things come up, uh, conflict comes up. So I'll extend to you one absence for whatever reason. Uh, anything beyond that is just going to collapse your grade uh, for the course. If something big comes up, let me know. Um, you know, I'm not a robot. I think there are lots of more important things in contemporary art. Uh, so if something uh, major comes up, a tragedy in the family or what have you, let me know. Talk to me about it. Otherwise, just be here. <laughs> Fair? Fair? Okay. Um, as far as participation, uh, I really value um, your engagement, really value it. So you are always welcome to ask questions. You're always welcome to stop me in the middle of something and, and launch a question or launch a, uh, a disagreement or a clarification. Sometimes, uh, sometimes I'll skip over steps in the train of thought, perhaps. That happens. Uh, so uh, back me up. How did you get from here to there? You're, you're welcome to. Uh, um, encouraged to participate as much as um, is necessary for you in this class um, because that's the way that we really digest and learn this stuff. Your education is not a matter of me delivering a bunch of stuff. Your education is you grabbing onto things and seeking out things. I'm just a facilitator for that. You're not passive. If you're a passive student, you won't learn much and it will just devolve into just memorizing of information or not memorizing of information. Either way, it's just information. And what I care about is not information. I care about understanding, clarity of understanding. So that's what we're seeking, so whatever we have to do to um, get that clarity is what we're after. 
as a, as a side note on that, uh, on the clarity business, I think with w w my strategy in this class is to try to present as clearly as I can an argument for each of the works that we look at. So I'm not going to provide a whole lot of critique of those works. I'll leave that to you <laughs> and to classroom discussion. So I, I'm, I may even say things I don't agree with, perhaps, um, as a means of presenting the most forceful argument for this or that artist, this or that way of thinking about art. And then we, we can dialogue about it. Um, I do put a couple notes in there. I just um, prefer that you are tuned in rather than tuned into phones or laptops or what have you. You'll have a couple of criticism papers to write in this class. We'll talk about that later. You can read over that on your own. You can read over those assignments on your own. I'll talk about them a bit in class at the beginning of each class as they come up, but uh, you can read over those on your own. Any questions on any of that stuff so far? No, good, good. You can read over that. Yeah, okay, you can read all that stuff. Um, the uh, course calendar, just to make a couple of notes on it. Um, what you see on the course calendar are uh, what we're doing for the day. Um, so it will either be in-class lecture or a field trip. And you'll notice that the in-class lecture is always divided into two parts. This class is scheduled from 10.30 to 2.20. <laughs> Uh, uh, that gives us time to do field trips, um, but w when we stay on campus, we're not going to uh, sort of be in class that entire four hours. Um, uh, we're going to take a lunch break halfway through. Um, I, I guess in theory, it's scheduled to be a 45 minute lunch break or so, so we have roughly three hours of in-class time. So we'll break every day about noon, take 45 minutes, come back, and then uh, go through it again. So you have two lectures there because they are kind of standalone lectures, um, each of them. And then you've got pre-class readings. Those are the ones that you need to have done before you come to class. And then there are additional resources there. Those additional resources are in your course pack, um, but they're not required reading. Those are things that I might reference in class, like there's this article, there's this. And, um, so I, I provide them to you if you want to take another look at them or if you want to. Um, spend more time at them. Check out if I've done justice to them or, or not. Any questions on that? On the course calendar, syllabus in general? Uh, you'll note that our first field trip is two weeks from today. Those field trips um, are wonderful. They will be a lot of fun. Um, but they are also, uh, they, make the, they make our timing fairly unpredictable. You know, driving to LA <laughs> uh, is just, uh, it's, it's not always predictable how traffic will go. So on those days, I would just really advise you to make your afternoon somewhat flexible uh, so that you don't have to be back here right at 2.20 because I can't guarantee that that will happen. Um, um, also, regarding those field trips, we are going to have to drive ourselves, so uh, we'll just carpool. So if you have a car and you would be willing to uh, drive on these field trips, uh, that would be wonderful, that would be great. Uh, think about it between now and next week, and we'll discuss it a little bit at, at the beginning of next class. Um, who can drive and uh, uh, do we have rides for everyone? Good, and of course, we'll pay for gas and mileage and parking and entrance fees and all of that stuff. Good, any questions about any of that? Are you ready to get down to business? <laughs> yes. Okay, then let's do it. Can you see that okay? Clear, and you can still see your papers? Okay. So this is contemporary art trends. What is this class? Uh, in, the, in the context of um, the courses here at Biola, it does come after modernity. 
So you take uh, Western Art History 1, Western Art History 2, and then Modernity. If you haven't taken Modernity, that's fine. That class is going through some restructuring, so it will actually disappear and get absorbed into the other art history classes. Um, uh, but in that kind of train of thought of, that our art history courses are set up as, uh, you could call this class post-modernity. It's whatever comes after modernity, the modern age, whatever you studied in modernity. Uh, this is the class after that. It's kind of difficult to pin down what post-modernity is, though. Um, it's a, perhaps we shouldn't title this class postmodernity because postmodernity is just a, it's a slippery term. For one, it's just inherently ambiguous. I mean, what does the prefix post mean? After. <laughs> after modernity. Uh, so what is that? Which way do you move after modernity? There is lots of disagreement about the proper way to move past modernity, or multiple interpretations about how we already have moved past modernity. And there are a lot of uh, suggestions that we haven't moved past uh, modernity at all. We find ourselves in some kind of a hyper-modernity, uh, a more intensified modernity. Um, and it's also unclear whether this is a reaction to modernity. We title ourselves post because we have responded to it and critiqued it and distanced ourselves from it, or whether it is trying to move on to something else, the next stage in thinking. Uh, take modernity and Im improve on it, fix its errors constructively. So it's pretty ambiguous. Uh, and beyond that, we might not want to call our, uh, our course post-modernity because there's lots of speculation that post-modernity might be over. <laughs> there are all sorts of people um, uh, uh, today who are saying that we are in some sort of a post-post-modernity, which sort of becomes ridiculous. Um, or an alter-modernity, something other. Uh, so we'll try to understand post-modernity in this class. Um, we'll try to understand what it is, what its features are, what its features are in art making. Um, but uh, we'll stick with the, the, the title uh, contemporary art trends. Um, multiple trends, multiple kind of trains of thought that have been running through the last 60 years, 65 years of art making um, um, that we'll try to track. We'll try to pull out some of those major threads, those major trains of thought, and think through what they are. And, and thus, where are we in contemporary terms? Where are we in the train of thought? Okay, so that's what we're after. Oh, I put in here, uh, you know, if, if you're not clear about what postmodern art looks like, this is postmodern art. We'll, we'll get back to Joseph Kosuth and try to understand him later. Um, um, and once again, I mentioned that um, my strategy in this class is to try to present a, a, compelling, a, a compelling case for the artwork we're looking at. And that will include trying to make a compelling case for post modernity and postmodernism. Um, now, once again, I know that that, that causes, that's, that's not always been a very popular term or concept around here, postmodernism. We might kind of find ourselves like clenching up uh, when uh, the teacher says, uh, this is a class in postmodernity, and I'm going to give you an argument for it. Um, but I think that's the honest way to reach clarity about it. So try to present a, a case for it, a case for what's been going on, and then we can kind of bat it around and critique it from the inside. Good? So that'll be, that'll be my strategy. Uh, our time before lunch, um, I want to try to understand modernity, get ourselves a running start into this class. And really, you could understand the first maybe two of our class periods as the, the late extensions of modernity. And then we'll try to understand the postmodern turn, the turn past modernity. Um, but if we're going to come to terms with what whatever postmodern is, we've got to come to terms with what the modern is, what modernity is. 
And once again, that's a pretty ambiguous term. Um, what is the modern? What do we mean by modern uh, modernity? And it's ambiguous because it tends to mean different things in different subjects, different disciplines, right? Um, I mean, it, in philosophy, if you study philosophy, you could start tracking modernity with the Enlightenment. You would kind of uh, equate it with Enlightenment thinking. Or you might back up even further and start with the Renaissance. Uh, basically, Renaissance to World War II as modernity. Uh, or maybe it's just, it's tighter, it's just the Enlightenment. Maybe uh, modernity is the beginning of the 20th century. Um, at any rate, it's, it's somewhat slippery, and it's also slippery within the arts because sometimes what we refer to as modernity in the arts is actually a reaction to modernity in philosophy or in politics or something like that, where we call ourselves modern artists uh, because it's the, the appropriate work to make in the modern period is one of reaction and resistance. But that means that modern art is actually sort of fighting against what we mean by modern in some of the other disciplines. It's somewhat slippery, but we're going to, for our sake, um, and this is fairly common within um, art history, the study of art history, we're going to think about modernity as starting sometime in the mid-19th century, 1800s, and extending up to World War II or so. It will continue into the 70s, maybe we're still in modernity, but usually what we mean by modernity, modernism in the arts um, is um, roughly impressionism through abstract painting, abstract expressionism, maybe into minimalism. So we'll, we'll talk through that. I might also mention, we may have to distinguish, and this may be helpful, to distinguish between modernity and modernism. And same with post-modernity and post-modernism. What what's the difference, what is an ism? When we say ism, what are we talking about, usually? What's that? A belief, we could call it a worldview, a way of a system of values, a system of ideas, a, a set of systems, ways of living life, um, uh, specifically ways of thinking about life. I guess it would be worldview. That would be modernism. So perhaps what are the what are the ideas in modernism? Uh, modernity. We might, we might refer actually to the larger systems, those larger systems, where ism is more of the thinking, the ideology, and the uh, modernity is more of the, the ways of living life, the, the, the context that we live in, the, the systems that govern our life, technology, um, um, uh, uh, politics, those sort of things, political structures, the things that shape your life and shape the way that we are as a people. And if we do make that distinction, then I suppose we could, we could say that we're sort of all post-moderns, we're all post-modernity, in post-modernity or hyper-modernity. Um, but we might not necessarily subscribe to forms of post-modernism. Anyway, uh, let's try to understand modernity. What's going on in modernity? Um, and we're going to take a running start into that. And we're going to use uh, one of our texts for today's class uh, to help us understand this and help us understand um, uh, perhaps what modernism is, what modernity is in the arts. So the, the text we're going to use before lunch is by a guy named Clement Greenberg. And Clement Greenberg was a very prominent art critic in the mid 20th century. Um, he is trained as a philosopher. I think he taught at Columbia, off the top of my head. I should know that. <laughs> uh, and uh, um, he was very prominent as a, an art uh, critic and very influential. Uh, and the essay that we're going to look at as a means of understanding what modernism, modern art is, is an essay called Towards a Newer Laocon. Towards a Newer Laocon. Um, what does that word mean, Laocon? If we just look at the title, uh, this might give us some cues as to what he's doing. 
What is Laocon? Have you heard that before? What is it? Yes, <laughs> this sculpture. Yes, yes. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a. This is a Greek sculpture about a Greek myth, Laocon and his sons, who uh, I believe you're right were uh, members, citizens of the city of Troy, and uh, he was warning, don't accept that horse, <laughs> don't let that horse into your city because. Uh, it's danger, it's not a gift, it's sabotage, right? You guys know the Trojan horse story. Um, uh, and in response to this, uh, one of the Greek goddesses, I think it's Athena maybe, uh, who wanted this to happen, uh, knew that Laocon was sort of uh, warning the people and so sent um, these snakes, this, uh, these deadly snakes to uh, bite Laocon, destroy he and his sons. Yeah. Sea serpents. sea serpents. Good. I'll I'll agree with that. It's been a while. I should brush up on that before coming to class, huh? Um, <clears throat> at any rate, when Greenberg is referring to Laocon, he is referring to the sculpture. And why is this sculpture so important? Uh, it was certainly important to the Greeks and to the Romans, um, but it became extremely important to Renaissance art making um, as well. Um, you have uh, uh, Pliny the Younger who says of this sculpture, this is a work to be preferred to all that the arts of painting and sculpture have produced. This is uh, a, a um, has become a standard, the kind of artistic canon that, uh, that we should follow in Western culture, uh, in, in Western art making. This is, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, at the pinnacle of art making. In its understanding of anatomy, its understanding of form and movement, its encapsulation of the human condition, and on and on and on. It is at the pinnacle of art making. So what is Greenberg saying just with the title of this essay? What do we need today? A new standard. A new, standard, a new pinnacle of art making. Why? Why would he say that this doesn't work anymore? Why can't this be the standard? Well, I mean, it's, it's old. <laughs> Maybe it's just boring to have really old standards. That could be part of, part of the argument. Um, but I think even more than that, he would say the context has shifted so much that this isn't really intelligible in the same way that it used to be. I mean, um, you've, got, you've got mass communication. You've got uh, television um, and um, radio and newspapers. You've got um, uh, capitalism and socialism. You've got totally different political structures and economic structures. You've got um, so much development within the arts that this doesn't have as much power as it used to or it doesn't have the same kind of power, or power in the same way. It can't uh, encapsulate the human condition and encapsulate our highest ideals in the same way that it used to. Uh, it, it's become mute in a way, or we've become deaf to it. We're tuned in to other stations to tie back into our technology, uh, uh, this is on technology. We're tuned into other stations. So Clement Greenberg is going to make an argument that uh, whatever the kind of pinnacle of art making is, however we understand it, it's gotta be a new standard. It has to be reconfigured. So let's try to uh, uh, um, dig through his art article and see what he's saying. Um, and so we first want to try to identify what is his diagnosis? What does he think is the problem? Why doesn't the... Um, uh, old Laocon work, the old standards work. What problem needs to be addressed? 
So if you have your essay, uh, you can take it out and refer to it. If you don't have it, that's fine. I'll try to put the quotes up on the screen. But you might, from now on, bring, bring those with you, bring your course pack with you, or at least the articles we're working on to class, because we'll refer to them and read from them and so on. And I want to start uh, by trying to get his diagnosis at the beginning of this essay. I think he lays it out. And he says this, starting from the very beginning here. And by the way, these are clipped down. I'm thinking about you guys. Uh, these are clipped down so that they're a little bit more manageable in length, because they're pretty dense. This is pretty dense reading, right? So I tried to clip it down so that you can concentrate on the few pages that we're going to talk about rather than the whole thing. That does mean, however, that if you're interested in this, uh, go, go back and read it, the whole thing at some point, and that may change your opinion. But um, I, I'm trying to give you only what uh, we'll talk about in class so we can maintain focus. Okay, so starting from the beginning, he says this. There can be, I believe, such a thing as a dominant art form. Dominant art form. This was what literature had become by, uh, in Europe by the 17th century. Now, when it happens that a single art is given the dominant role, it becomes the prototype of all art. The others try to shed their proper characteristics and imitate its effects. The dominant art, in turn, tries itself to absorb the functions of the others. So what happens when an artwork, an art form is dominant? Uh, if, if literature, for instance, becomes the dominant art form, then what, what that means is that the other art forms, um, like painting, for instance, tries to shed the characteristics that are unique to it and tries to absorb the characteristics of literature. So painting, for instance, that does what literature does or operates analogous to literature. Yeah? I was a little, I guess, surprised or confused when I read that just because, I don't know, it seemed, I'm just wondering why that was the case um, to, to say that because it seems like painting has been such a primary art form. Ah. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so, so the question is, uh, did you all hear? Okay, yeah. Um, uh, so, so it seems like the question is, is, is it just narrative only belongs to literature, or can that belong to painting uh, in its own way? And if it does belong in its own way, how is, it, how is the way painting does narrative different and fully distinct from how literature does narrative? Um, Let's suspend that question for just a, a moment. I'll show you some examples, and we'll try to get more of what he says. But I think that's, that's a really good question to ask at this point. Is narrative and literary subjects dominance, uh, the uh, subjugation, a uh, painting subjugation to literature? Is that, is that what he means? Or is it more complicated than that? Um, so we'll go on. The dominant art, in turn, tries to absorb the functions of the others, and a confusion of the arts results, by which the subservient ones are perverted and distorted. They are forced to deny their own nature in an effort to attain the effects of the dominant art. However, the subservient arts can only be mishandled in this way when they have reached such a degree of technical facility as to enable them to pretend to conceal their mediums. In other words, the artist must have gained such power over his material as to annihilate it, seemingly in favor of illusion. So uh, just to... Um, make sure we're tracking with him. What is his diagnosis? In his words, um, if one art form is given a dominant role over the other art forms, then what results is a confusion. And he, he's, I think what he's after is trying to correct confusions, the confusion. That's sort of what drives him. We'll see uh, later on next week. He's very interested in Kant, Immanuel Kant, who's trying to 
make the disciplines of reason and aesthetic judgment and so on um, self-sufficient totally self-sufficient so they're not being confused and all wrapped up and muddled in other in other um, uh, disciplines so he's trying to correct the confusion by distinguishing what's specific and unique about each of the art forms He's, he, and, and as long as one art form is dominating the others, the confusion persists. And what does the confusion look like? It, is, it looks like the subservient ones, like painting or sculpture, being perverted and distorted so that they are forced to deny their own nature in an effort to attain the effects of the dominant art, literature. They behave like literature, and they can only behave like literature when they cease to cloak and withhold the way that, that, that they really are in themselves. And as he says, how, how does this happen? How do they cloak themselves? It is by concealing the medium itself. The medium itself. So what's the medium of painting? Paint and wood and canvas, something flat, an object that hangs in a room, um, the stuff that the thing is made of, um, the, the mediums of, uh, or media, of sculpture would be the, the, the stone, the wood, the plaster, whatever it's made out of. Um, and as long as those are concealing themselves in order to represent something else or behave in a, liter a literary way, then they're always wrapped up in this kind of illusion where they are presenting something other than themselves. Okay, does that make sense as his diagnosis? What he sees as a confusion, something wrong, something off. And what is he, what are his examples? He doesn't name names so much, but we could certainly find examples all over the place, right? When you look at this, what do you see? What is this? The death of Socrates? Greenberg would say, you're already confused. This is not the death of Socrates. This is paint on canvas. And it, precisely what it's doing is concealing itself or being arranged in such a way that what you think about and pay attention to the way you're impacted by this painting is not uh, the paint itself, the medium itself. Rather, you're launched almost immediately into thinking about Socrates and his, his um, what, voluntary suicide execution, right? Um, I would rather die and hold true to the good, the true, and the beautiful than to renounce it. So I'll take the hemlock. And Greenberg is saying that whole discussion is, uh, is subservient. It's painting acting as a handmaiden to literature, right? I mean, very directly in this case, it's painting serving um, Socrates. <laughs> It's a literature, uh, uh, very directly. It's written form as being more important and more um, uh, dominant than the painting itself, the visual effect of the thing itself, the forms themselves. It's so hard to see these forms without seeing flesh and seeing fabric, seeing stone. And as he goes on to say, uh, on the uh, opposite side of the page over here, right-hand column about halfway down, total subservience to literature occurs when all emphasis is taken away from the medium and transferred to the subject matter. And that's what's happening in that Death of Socrates painting. What is, what is medium? That's the paint, the canvas, that sort of stuff. What is subject matter? what it depicts, what the painting is of. Socrates, for instance. So when the emphasis is taken away from the medium and transferred to the subject matter, um, I think that's what he would say is subservience to literature. And that kind of gets back to Amy's question. 
I think Greenberg would say that narrative of any kind, and I think he might even go so far as to say representation, subject matter at all, is subservience to literature. <laughs> I don't know if that's fair. Uh, simply because I don't know that, I mean, so what is literature? I mean, what isn't, isn't literature, I mean, I think we would be fairly disappointed if we were to read a book and only draw our attention to the medium and not the subject matter. I mean, I think what he's calling for in painting is analogous to uh, a book that doesn't say doesn't, it's not, it doesn't say anything. It's just forms on paper, right? So maybe in his scheme, literature is subservient to something else. So it's not necessarily the painting is subservient to literature, it's that all of them are behaving as media. I mean, he might have a point in, in, a, in an instance like this, where clearly the subject matter is derived from literature. I don't know, yeah. Yeah. words on a page yeah. instead of like trying to convey a message which is like yeah. to me what I think of most artists is doing like the death of Socrates like they're trying to like depict a story which is the literature thing yeah. exactly mm. exactly what he's talking about but it's almost like he's trying to take away from that as if like he's mad or almost jealous of what the artists are doing <laughs> like I don't know yeah me, yeah. Think of, he's trying to simplify it and be like, why are you trying to, to yeah. do all these other things? At least that's yeah. what was yeah. first Yeah. Impression. Yeah. Uh, that you're, um, the way you're reading Greenberg's train of thought is that he is basically making the paintings meaningless. <laughs> he's trying to drain them of Almost meaning. Start just yeah. simplifying it to being what it's made out of. Yes. Like what yes. The yep. To that's right. And initially, that's going to cause a sort of knee-jerk reaction in us. Like, oh, why are you, why are you draining the thing of meaning? Um, I, what he's going to argue, and we'll see this more next week, is that um, I think he's actually going to say, would say, um, that the way that it means has to change. If the way that you see a painting meaning, carrying meaning, is through the narrative and the subject matter that it conveys, then yes, I am draining it of meaning and un unraveling its meaning and trying to withhold its meaning. But I think he would say, you're, that is positioning the meaning of the painting in the wrong place. We're gonna try to uh, understand the way that a painting can mean in a different way not narratively and not in terms of subject matter. And, and what we'll see, m second half of this class, is that if you don't have meaning or, um, uh, not meaning, if you don't have narrative subject matter as a way of make, having the painting mean something, what do you have left? You have the meaningfulness of form, the construction of form, and you have the meaningfulness of artistic action, artistic engagement and what the artist is doing and the way the artist is present in the world and present to the canvas is a way of, is meaningful. And so he would say, mm, if you regard what I'm saying as a, a prescription for meaninglessness, you, have, you, you are still, you're stuck in the old Laocon. Yeah. <laughs> Of like what they've done with the colors of the form. Yeah. Saying we go straight to. Ah. Uh, you know, so great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Looking at the appreciation for. Yeah. The artist's process, or mm. you know, whatever, what have you. Yeah, that's right. That in a way, he wants us to back up a step and regard. I mean, he might say that this painting, if it doesn't mean Socrates and that whole virtue and all of those things, if it doesn't mean that, then we regard it as meaningless. He would say, ooh, and maybe he would say, I'm putting these words in his mouth. He would say, ooh, you're a nihilist. 
because you think that form and color and medium and the activity of an artist is meaningless until we tack meaning onto it. He would say, then you believe in an essentially meaningless world. It's, it's humans constructing meaning. That's, that's, in a sense, nihilism. He wants to back us up a, a, a step and say, nope, already meaningful. This, already meaningful, if you just let it impact you. Uh, and, and so the confusion of the arts is one in which painting doesn't get to mean in the way that painting can uniquely mean, the way that it can mean something um, that literature can't, that it can't do it. So he wants to uh, revive the meaningfulness of painting as uniquely meaningful in ways that the other, that music isn't or that um, uh, literature isn't. Yeah? He's going to focus on that, yeah. Um, but he's going to, I think he's going to put even more emphasis on the, the meaningfulness of form. Yeah. So it's action, the relationship between the artist and the canvas. Uh, and we'll get into that a lot, the second half of class. But it's also form itself. How does form itself, the construction of form, carry meaning before there's any narrative or subject matter attached to it? Yeah, process. That's going to be important to him. Mm -hmm. OK, so what he wants to do is, if this is subservience, taking emphasis away from the medium and putting it onto subject matter, he's going to try to reverse the flow and reverse the emphasis from subject matter, downplaying subject matter, and upplaying the medium, emphasizing the medium. And a couple more examples. I mean, he mentions the 17th and 18th century as being the kind of height of the concealing of the medium. I think it extends quite a bit later than that, uh, well into the 19th century, where you have a painting like this, and it's just hard to look at it as a painting, as, as paint, as medium. You're so immediately um, uh, thinking about and feeling seduction temptation, fleshy bodies, tempting this uh, satyr, and so on. Um, and that is what uh, Greenberg will refer to as the, the sort of withdrawal of the medium for the sake of the subject matter. In some sense, the medium, the paint, becomes invisible so that we're able to see bodies. Because it's really hard to see both at once, isn't it? <laughs> Both paint, flat surface, and bodies. Yeah? I'm just thinking it's interesting with this particular type of painting, like the French Rococo, because they weren't really about anything. Like they really, in and of themselves, there was some quotation about like um, artists getting better and better at saying less and less until they said nothing. Basically, uh. in Rococo painting. Uh. Yeah. Almost just the form, which is also that's interesting. As part of, I guess, this critique. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. Uh, that, in a way, this this is the sort of uh, sort of early movements towards Greenberg, in that it's about feeling and sensation of the forms. It's just that Greenberg would say. Well, if that's what it's about, why are you messing around with nymphs and satyrs and things like that? Why flesh and body, you know, all this illusion? Why not just let the f forms themselves, the color themselves, seduce you? Can the painting seduce you? OK. Um, uh, just to back up a bit, I, I suppose we would say that Greenberg would identify traditional religious art as kind of having the same problems, a subservience to literature. Within Christian art especially, it's subservient to which literature? Scripture or um, theology even. Um, images illustrating or representing literature. 
He's not as bothered, though, I think, about traditional Christian art because there's this thing in, there's this, this sort of mode in religious art where the image offers itself and withholds itself simultaneously, especially in the Middle Ages, uh, especially in kind of Byzantine iconography. The image emphasizes its flatness and he is gonna, he's gonna say that's, that's a good thing. Now, the Christians uh, offered the image and withheld it, emphasized its subject matter and flattened it um, as a way of saying, this is, this, is, this is Jesus, but this is only an image. Don't worship this thing. This is just language. This is just a construction. Um, so, and it's, it's, it's uh, just a construction and you can't see it in the sense that um, th these are heavenly realms. Um, your imagination can't kind of, um, shouldn't collapse um, the heavenly realms into the manageable, uh, something easily manageable for you. Um, so Greenberg is gonna say this is, this is okay, this is better than what happens later on. <laughs> um, but all through the Christian tradition, you have this dialectic between offering an image, a representational image, and flattening it out, withholding it, making it appear as a flat surface and as a, um, as a figure, the Madonna and child, for instance. And that's something for further thought about kind of traditional Christian imagery that I think is, is fairly fascinating, that relationship between the representation and the, the flatness, the substance of the, of the image itself. The image as an object, the image as an image. It's with the Renaissance that things start running off the rails in Greenberg's narrative, right? What happens in uh, the Renaissance, what happens between this and this? You have the increasing illusion of the paint, the paint itself, the medium itself concealing itself so that you see even more and more seamlessly the Madonna and child in our space as though it's a continuation of our space, our visual space. And, and he is, of course, going to say or, or regard this as the transition from emphasis on medium to subject matter. And once you're there, then you have uh, painting becoming totally subservient to literature. And totally operating as illusion. One thing you're going to uh, hear as these, these artists in this um, in the kind of modernist movement, one thing you're going to hear over and over again is an emphasis on truthfulness, reality, collapsing illusion, and emphasizing the reality of the thing, the scientific reality, which is the thing itself. This is an illusion. What we're interested in is the thing itself. Huh? So you're going to get this kind of paradoxical um, or maybe initially confusing emphasis on truth and reality. Well, I, I guess both people or people on either side of this argument are going to just disagree about what we mean by truth and reality in a painting, <laughs> right? But certainly uh, there's, there's plenty of argument, there's plenty of argument to be made of painting being subservient to literature. And that might not be a bad thing. Um, but it might cause us to run over too quickly what painting is itself. Okay, so what does Greenberg then um, articulate as being the response? What's the response to this? If this is the problem, subservience that results in confusion about the arts, then what's the response. Um, you'll see that at the bottom of the second column. And we'll read, we'll read some of that. He says this, as the first and most important item upon its agenda, the avant-garde, he introduces the, the term avant-garde here, as the first and most important item on its agenda, the avant-garde saw the necessity of an escape from ideas 
which were infecting the arts with the ideological struggles of society. Ideas came to mean subject matter in general, subject matter as distinguished from content. Oh, that's gonna be important. We'll sort that out here in a bit. Um, ideas came to mean subject matter in general. In parentheses, subject matter is distinguished from content in the sense that every work of art must have content. It must be meaningful. But that subject matter is something the artist does or does not have in mind when he is actually at work. This meant a new and greater emphasis upon form. And it also involved the assertion of the arts as independent vocations, disciplines, and crafts, absolutely autonomous and entitled to respect for their own sakes and not merely as vessels of communication. It was the signal for a revolt against the dominance of literature, which was subject matter at its most oppressive. That's kind of dense, isn't it? <laughs> Did you get any of that? We'll sort through it, what he just said, because uh, it's important uh, to understanding um, his take on what the modern is. First, it's important to point out that his response, what he sees as the response to this confusion, is the avant-garde. Have you heard that term before? In modernity, I imagine you covered that term. What does the avant-garde mean? What does the word mean? What does the term mean? Avant is forward and guard is guard. <laughs> uh, so what does it mean? It's a French term that means the advance guard or the forward guard. It's a military term, right? Um, there's in, in kind of military movements, uh, the rear guard are the people who are in the back, making sure you don't get ambushed from the back, sort of following up, protecting the, the kind of main, the main group from behind. So what is the avant-garde then, or the forward guard? Those who are out in front of everything. They see what's coming. They see the dangers, they see the landscape, they see the terrain, they see what's coming before anyone else. It's a kind of self-congratulating term, really, to title yourself the avant-garde. But basically it is, the, what the avant-garde do is they are the artists who are out in front and they see what has to happen and they see how things have to change and how the whole community, the whole army, the battalion needs to change direction to avoid further error or what have you. So who are the avant-garde in 20th century art criticism and in Greenberg's use of the term? It's those artists who are out in front who are working towards the newer Laocon. They're going to uh, art articulate and identify what the new standards are gonna be and what the new way of meaning in art is going to be. And he gives us some very specific jobs for the avant-garde to do. And at this point, in 1940, he's, he's partially, I think, prescribing what artists need to do, but he's also identifying what they have been doing. What has the avant-garde been doing? And he gives us a couple things in that passage we just read. First, they need to remove subject matter from art by distinguishing it from content, right? He says in that passage that I read, Ideas were infecting the arts. Infecting. <laughs> but ideas, what I mean by ideas, ideas came to mean subject matter. But that's not the same as content, is what he wants to say. What is subject matter? We've already defined it. It's what a painting is about, or what an artwork is about. Uh, the sculpture that we were looking at um, is has the subject matter of Laocon, right? But what is content? What does that mean? What does the word content mean in art? What's actually depicted? What's depicted? Yeah, depicted is gonna, f is gonna fall back into subject matter. What's depicted, what it's about, uh, the, what, it, what it images, the scene, that would all kind of funnel back into subject matter. Yeah. Good. 
you have like the action of the piece, like the, like the action of the artist that's left on whatever. Sure. If it's a painting. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So the, the kind of bigger, it's bigger containings. Yeah. Uh, Evan, did you have a? Yeah, I was going to say, like, it's, it's what the painting is actually saying. Ah. Okay, good. What it means. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, Taylor, did you want to yeah, add on to that? With her definition, how that differs, or what form it is exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I think what he is meaning here uh, with content, and usually what it, it means in this, this kind of art discussions, is that the content, is, it, when it's distinguished from subject matter, is the meaning, the meaningfulness of the thing. And that, um, you're right to say f form and what it contains more broadly, because that's where he's going to put the meaning, but when he distinguishes subject matter from content, he's distinguishing what is pictured from what it means, how it means. So what he's going to say is, to get back uh, to an earlier point, what he's going to say, uh, what he wants to do, is to, is, is to say that um, if we remove subject matter from painting, we haven't removed meaning. We haven't removed content. When we remove ideas from painting, which he's going to say, he's going to, what he means by ideas, he says ideas become attached to subject matter. So ideas are what you're trying to depict. I've got this agenda that I want to communicate, and that's, that's what the idea is or the subject matter is. But he's going to say that's not what it ends up meaning. The meaning is bigger than that. Meaning isn't necessarily tied to what you want the work to be about <laughs> or what you're depicting. After all, there are a million ways to depict the Madonna and child, same subject matter, and have them come out meaning totally different things, totally opposite things. You can depict the Madonna and child, same subject matter, um, in total blackness and in total gold, and those are going to mean something uh, incredibly different. And that, the, the difference in the meaning is in the form of the thing, not in the subject matter. So this, our earlier conversation about if you drain the thing of subject matter, does it become meaningless? Uh, Greenberg says, no, it's still meaningful. We just have to let it mean in a different way. And we have to do that at the beginning by distinguishing what it shows from what it means. Okay. So we got to get those straight to understand what he's saying. And he says this pretty directly. How do you distinguish between them? Well, it means a new and greater emphasis on form or the meaningfulness of form, asserting each of the arts as absolutely autonomous and entitled to respect for their own sakes, not merely as vessels of communication. That's what he means. This vessels of communication business is what he uh, is his problem with subject matter, his problem with expressing ideas in your artwork. It's treating the artwork as an empty container to ram communication through. And he says when you do that, you don't, you're not doing justice to the thing itself, the, the form itself. And he gives us a timeline here. He gives us some examples. If you follow on the, the left column of that second page, he gives some specific examples. The first one he mentions is Courbet. Greenberg says that uh, Courbet is, in, in many ways, the kind of first avant-garde painter. In fact, he says this directly. He says, Courbet, the first real avant-garde painter, tried to reduce his art to immediate sense data by painting only what the eye could see as a machine unaided by the mind. Right? You know the famous quote from Courbet. He was asked, um, why don't you paint angels? Why don't you paint religious scenes? Yes, good. If you show me an angel, I'll paint it. I'll paint anything that the world pres presents to me. The world doesn't present angels, and it doesn't present Jesus. It doesn't present 
uh, historical narratives. The world presents this to me, and so I will respond to it in painting. Yeah. And so Greenberg is going to say, that's that initial kind of um, um, the first beginnings of that avant-garde trajectory is, is becoming in tune with what presents itself and how what presents itself means. It's still subject matter, but he's saying uh, we're breaking off in the right direction here. Secondly, he, uh, in the following paragraph, he identifies Impressionism as extending the avant-garde project. Why? Because when you look at a Monet painting, for instance, what's the subject matter here? What's depicted? The cathedral at different times of day. But what is it, what's the content of the thing? Does the painting have really anything to do with the cathedral? <laughs> Not really. Not really. I mean, I guess you could say that this is sort of, there's some uh, sort of transcendence that's happening, uh, dissolving, and the, the cathedral I can't enter because I can't quite get it, or something like that. It's too mediated by light and vision and changing context. I don't know. You could wrap the cathedral into the meaning of the painting. I think you have to, really. But uh, Greenberg is going to identify Impressionism, Monet perhaps specifically, as being an important step in the avant-garde movement because it's so concerned with impression, the way the world presents itself, uh, the color, the form, the activity of painting. So when you look at a Monet painting, you see paint, you see brush strokes, and you see a person responding sensitively to form and color and movement of light. And there's tremendous meaning in that. Does that make sense? But it's shifted away from the subject matter, the emphasis, and more onto the form or the response of the artist. Not entirely. The subject matter is still there, but we're moving in the right direction. Thirdly, he identifies later in that paragraph, he identifies Manet. Manet, meanwhile, closer to Courbet, was attacking subject matter on its own terrain by including it in his pictures and exterminating it then and there. <laughs> what, is, what does that mean? How, do, how is uh, Manet including subject matter and exterminating it, attacking it then and there? Well, he does so in this painting by taking the conventions of painting. I mean, if you look at this painting, it's a weird painting, isn't it? I mean, what is going on in this, pa in this painting? Some sort of scandalous whatnot. Um, but you, you start paying attention to it, kind of like, what is this painting of anyway? And you start to realize, oh, this is, these are all of the conventions of traditional painting colliding with each other. So you've got the landscape. It's a landscape painting. It's a nude painting. There's a still life. There's a bather. And there's the kind of, self-congratulating critics and observers, male observers, who are in, wrapped up into the painting, observing all of the sort of <laughs> in a non kind of disturbed way, as though a nude sitting in front of you is no, no big deal, right? With a kind of aesthetic detachment. I mean, he's taking all of these conventions of Western painting and just annihilating them by wrenching them around each other. I mean, this painting is totally confusing in the way that all of these conventions are jarring with each other, but also the spatial structure of it itself. Things are flying around. The, the bather is way too big. She looks like a giant. She's not spatially located correctly. The thing is a total mess, but it's an intentional mess. And if you if you give Manet enough kind of rope, enough line, uh, what you find that he's doing is drawing attention not to the subject matter, not to the nude, the man, the landscape, those sort of things, but he's drawing attention to the conventions of painting, right? This painting is about painting, 
about the conventions of painting. And that is why Greenberg is going to say that Manet is attacking subject matter on its own terrain by including it in his pictures, landscape, bather, still life, etc., and exterminating it then and there in the painting. Okay, are you, are you, you feel like you got your hands around Greenberg a little bit? Good. Um, we need to break for lunch. Let me see if I can get just a little bit further and then we'll break. And I won't, I won't cut short your lunch time at all. Um, so first, we remove the avant-garde. What it does is it removes subject matter from art by distinguishing it from meaning, from content. And we see that really directly with Manet. What does that painting mean? It's not the subject matter that carries the meaning. It means because of the way that painting is wrapped around itself. And we're supposed to think about painting. Um, but secondly, the second thing the avant-garde does is to expand the physical, sensorial power of the medium itself. If you're going to shift the emphasis from subject matter to form, or, yeah, to form, you got to make the form more powerful, more noticeable in itself. And he starts saying that on the second column of that second page, about three lines down in the middle of that um, sentence there. Uh, he says, uh, there's a common effort in each of the arts to expand the expressive resources of the medium, not in order to express ideas and notions, to use it as a vessel of communication, but to express with greater immediacy sensations, the irreducible elements of experience. He wants you to have a sensory experience in front of the painting and to be in touch with how uh, sensations can be meaningful to us. And so, what is going to be his example? What other art form does this really well? Carries meaning through form without subject matter or without uh, subjugating itself to literature? Music. And you get that about halfway down the second column of that second page. Music. Look to music as a role model. It is meaningful as pure form, as he says. Right? When I go to uh, uh, the LA Phil and I see, or uh, yeah, um, attend a, a um, performance of Tchaikovsky, there's no narrative over it. I mean, I guess there could be, and there's narrative associated with it, and, and uh, musicians will disagree about this, but I'll channel Greenberg for a minute. There's no narrative, there's no lyrics, there are no, there's no subject matter, it's not about anything, but it is extraordinarily meaningful. It moves me deeply. And how does it move me? It moves me by uh, arranging form, pitch, and rhythm, uh, lows and highs, fast and slows. <laughs> Uh, it arranges those in relation to each other, and that moves me deeply. Why, says Greenberg, can't painting do the same thing? We got all the same tools. It's just a different medium. Uh, we've got color, which operates in the same way that pitch might. We've got rhythm. Uh, in painting. We've got rhythm in painting. We've got um, uh, fast and slow. We have expansion and contraction. We've got all of that in painting. Why do you need to m sort of muck it up with subject matter? Uh, and uh, so we could point to very directly an artist who gets that and is thinking exactly that, Vasily Kandinsky who is extremely interested in music. He wrote a little book called On the Spiritual in Art. It's a, it's a f fascinating little book where he talks about the avant-garde and he points directly to music and he says, look, painting can do everything music can do as long as we st stop um, uh, attributing the meaning of the painting to only what it pictures. If you just back off of all of that and you let the color and the form work, 
it can operate as a musical composition or in an analogous way to musical composition. They're, they're using, and that's an important point, they're using music as a role model, not as what painting should imitate. You shouldn't have painting imitating music now. You should just have painting saying, well, music can do it. Why can't painting do it, right? So uh, Kandinsky is going to withdraw the subject matter so maybe you have a landscape there, but it's so withdrawn that what, what is important about this painting, what we, what we have to experience in this painting, is the relationship between color and form, the way that it pulls us in certain directions and opens us up in other directions, and so on. And Kandinsky had pretty elaborate theories about um, how uh, music could operate, or art could operate in a way analogous to music, and thus you'll often see his paintings just titled composition, as in analogous to musical composition. Okay, so let's get to the main point here and then we'll break for lunch. What is the thesis then? So we've been tracking Greenberg's essay, we've been identifying what he sees as the problem, the diagnosis, what the response is, the avant-garde is the response. So what is the thesis? What does he say is the, the main point here, the main argument? Um, ooh, yeah, mm. um, I think we get that on the uh, third page. And the first column underneath where it has the Roman numeral five. A few lines down. The arts lie safe now, each within its legitimate boundaries, and free trade has been replaced by autarky, meaning self-rule. Purity in art consists in the acceptance the willing acceptance of the limitations of the medium of the specific art. And then jumping down just a bit to the next paragraph. The arts then have been hunted back to their mediums and there they have been isolated, concentrated, and defined. It is by virtue of its medium that each art is unique and strictly itself. To restore the identity of an art, the opacity of its medium, the opacity of its medium. So the medium doesn't become transparent. It becomes itself. It becomes opaque in a way. The opacity of its medium must be emphasized. For the visual arts, the medium is discovered to be physical. Hence, pure painting and pure sculpture seek above all else to affect the spectator physically, through your eyes, the form, without uh, just getting into the realm of ideas, but to uh, affect you uh, physically. And so he says, he, he says this in the part that we read, purity, in a kind of nutshell, purity is in art, consists in the acceptance, willing acceptance of the limitations of the medium of the specific art. It is by virtue of its medium that each art is unique and strictly itself. And this is the thesis. If you take nothing away, uh, nothing else away from this essay, here it is. It's the uh, second full paragraph on the, in the second column of that third page. And this is it. This is his argument. The history of avant-garde painting is that of a progressive surrender to the resistance of the medium, which resistance consists chiefly in the flat picture plane's denial of efforts to hole through it for, I think he would put realistic in quotes, because <laughs> what is he identifying as more real? The picture plane. So the resistance consists chiefly in the flat picture plane's denial of efforts to hole through it for realistic perspectival space. So what does avant-garde painting do? It doesn't allow you one point perspective and all of that illusion. It doesn't allow you to hole through it and create a, a kind of false reality, an illusion of space and figures in space telling stories about this or that. Um, Avant-garde painting needs to 
be in touch with what is really there and progressively surrender to the materiality of the thing itself. And that means flatness. The painting has to be flat and it has to be uh, forcefully s sort of um, uh, sensually um, alive, if you will. It has to strike you in the same way that music strikes you. Is that does that make sense? You follow what he's doing? Any uh, particular questions come to mind? Things that you were you were talking about or specific questions? I usually give a little bit of time right after lunch for, because I, I don't know if you're like me. I'm actually, I think I'm a pretty slow thinker. Um, hopefully good thinker, <laughs> but slow. Things take a, a little while for me to sort of piece, piece things together, and I find that if I go away to lunch, um, I'll have formulated my question that I wanted to ask in class about 45 minutes later <laughs> when it's done. So anyway, I usually make a little time right after lunch if there's anything rolling around in your head. Yeah? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, yeah, right. <clears throat> Photo kind of messes everything up in a way. And we'll talk about that here at the, at the beginning of this uh, lecture, this afternoon's lecture. Photography kind of messes things up. And um, one of the ways that it messes it up, other than undercutting painting, painting's ability to represent the world, it also is like, we were talking about literature in the first part of the class. What does literature do? What is, what is the medium of literature if it doesn't present something through it? Photography is kind of the same way. I mean, you could, I, uh, there have been lots of experiments with abstract photography, just trying to take in light um, in sort of abstract forms or patterns or whatever. But, it's kind of, you know, photography is a kind of open mechanical eye towards the world. It sort of seems like a, a strange ideological gymnastics to restrict what it pays attention to, to only pure kind of color and form. I mean, photography is just one of those things where it's, it just so quickly represents and so inevitably has subject matter. I mean, it has subject matter built into it if it is taking in anything that's external to itself in a way. Um, it's hard for photo to just be paper, a flat picture plane, what, with ink on it, paper exposed, I, you know? So photo causes a big problem in all of this. And that might have part, uh, it might have a role to play in why post, in why photography is so important to postmodernism. Because it doesn't fit modernism very well. <laughs> so that's a kind of pointing ahead. Remember, we're still in modernism. Everything we're talking about now is modernity. Photography is going to be a key, have a key role to play in, in postmodern art. Does that kind of address your question? Okay, good. Yeah, I am. Like, this video also, like how, like really, like, I know photography is you know, affected by it, but video as well. Yeah, video, yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> the video is going to lend itself pretty, um, Pretty, uh, uh, we're going to start talking about action, the activity of the artist. Video is going to lend itself really well towards documenting action, activity. So we have a turn towards artistic activity, and video is going to be really well suited for that. Video is also real well suited, as is photography, for social critique. Both of those are reasons why it's important to, why they, those mediums are important to um, postmodern art making is because you already have so much use of photography and video in advertising, in commercial work, that once artists take those up and start subverting them, criticizing the way that they're being used, 
in advertising or in the kind of broader culture, um, uh, they're going to be really potent media for doing that, right? In a way that painting isn't. I mean, what you know? How does how does painting do social critique? It doesn't have not enough people look at paintings <laughs> for it to have any kind of social criticism or a whole lot of it. Whereas if you take up the media that are so um, so much a part of everyday life, like photography and video. If you take those up and you work inside of them, you've got, you've got a lot more potential for social critique because they're already in social use. Does that, does that make some sense? That's kind of foreshadowing where we're going with postmodernism. Talk of the postmodern. Both great questions. OK, let's, uh, let's jump back into it. <clears throat> Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.